Um, so my name is Stephanie Perry. I was diagnosed in 2015. Um, I was 26 years old. Um, I did three different chemotherapy regimens and then I went to my autologous stem cell transplant. I continued with chemotherapy, radiation, um, and then I had my second um, allogeneic transplant um, with my sister as my donor. And um, my cancer journey was a lot longer than I expected um, than the initial six months of treatment that I got. Um, I think, you know, I had no idea walking into this that I would be going through years and years of treatment, let alone two stem cell transplants. Um, so it's taken a lot. It's taken a lot of time and um, a whole village of people to get me to this point. But here I am about five and a half years into remission now. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more to come. After my second stem cell transplant and knowing that I was in remission um, for real, <laughs> um, I started to, you know, try to get back into the swing of things, become a productive member of society again, maybe use my master's degree that I had to <laughs> finish before I started treatment. Um, so it was a lot of learning that I had to do dealing with being a cancer patient, even though I don't look like a cancer patient, trying to find work that I was able to do. Um, and even going through, you know, things like getting married and having a wedding. There's a lot of things that as a cancer patient, I had to take into account. So it does become part of all these other parts of your life in some way, shape, or form. Um, so I met my husband through a popular dating app <laughs> that my friend had signed me up for. Um, it was about six months after I was already in treatment. So um, I was already very much in, you know, my cancer era. <laughs> and um, I was just very, I, I didn't really want to date, but my friend, she kind of forced me out there. <laughs> um, so I was very straightforward. I was like, you know, I have cancer, I'm still going through treatment. Um, but luckily he was very receptive and understanding. Um, the first time we met was in the winter time. So I was wearing a lot of hats. <laughs> Um, and I just remember he was just, he was like, just take your hat off, you know, <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm good, you know, like, so it was, it was an interesting time, but I think it, we were only dating like a few months before I went to my first transplant, so it was, it, it moved very fast because of where I was in my treatment, and you know, I think that's why I was so straightforward when I first started talking to him, because I knew that I had to do this and, you know, he couldn't get in the way. <laughs> Either he was in or out, you know, I didn't have time to waste. <laughs> so yeah, luckily he was on board. <laughs> I was actually really grateful for that because I was going through grad school and, you know, dating during college and school is like completely different. And I feel like I was in a place where like life was becoming very real. <laughs> and I knew that I didn't have any time to just like play around anymore. Like I needed something serious. Um, and it really kind of like weeded out everybody. <laughs> So it was kind of easy because, you know, once that like C word comes up, people either run to help you or they run away. <laughs> so luckily that 
that sorted out a lot of things in my life, um, not just with the relationship dating department, but also with, you know, friends and unfortunately some families. Um, yeah, so I have been extra careful nowadays, especially post COVID. Um, still very careful. <laughs> um, but every time I get, you know, I live in Georgia, it gets really hot. So I will sweat at night. <laughs> but sometimes it'll be like a really hot day. <laughs> and I, you know, I might sweat a lot that night. Um, so it really, I guess it's like a, a trigger that kind of reminds me of you know, like, oh, this is what happened last time. So, you know, be on the lookout. Um, you know, that's one of the things that cancer has taught me is how to listen to your body and what it's telling you. And so I just, I just find myself very much more aware of how my body is feeling. Um, even I, this was like a at the beginning of this year or something, but I have, I still have this lymph node that is still like a little, you know, it's a, my husband will catch me just like touching my neck and <laughs> where my other like lymph nodes were and stuff, you know, I just subconsciously check myself all the time. Um, but yeah, like every little thing can be triggering to, it's really hard to get out of that mindset. Um, like my doctor has told me several times, like, you know, that's just an overreactive lymph node. Uh, you're going to feel it. Um, it's nothing to worry about. But then, you know, like I, I made her like schedule me for a scan. <laughs> um, so I think it's important to listen to your body, um, but also just recognizing that, you know, sometimes a cold is just a cold. But then I have this trust in myself now where I know that, you know, okay, yeah, this could be just a cold, but, you know, maybe this is something else. And it just, I think there's just some like different kind of feeling in your body that lets you know, like, this is not normal. Um, so as long as I don't get that feeling when I get a cough or when I get a cold or something, um, I'm good, but I think that one overreactive lymph node was just the one that really freaked me out because I wasn't used to that one. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, so with all the follow-up care, um, meeting with different doctors, it is a lot of, I feel like educating them on how to treat a cancer patient um, so it's a lot of repeating questions and a lot of t explaining to them what your scars are <laughs> and, you know, what your radiation tattoos look like. <laughs> um, but they, they, I think they literally look at just my age and not really because I'm Asian. So like, I don't look like I'm 34. <laughs> so they just literally look at me. They're like, she's young. I don't need to check out these sections. And then later when I'm like, um, yeah, I've had cancer. They'll, they'll bring up that page and they'll be like, oh yeah, you marked it here. You know? <laughs> so I hope it brings awareness <laughs> so that they, they make sure that they read the entire chart before talking. <laughs> But I think it's also like a good learning experience for doctors who haven't had to deal with young cancer patients. Um, and I luckily I have had um, a lot of doctors who, you know, after meeting me, they'll go do their own research about how to best provide care for a cancer patient. So, you know, it's it's frustrating having to retell your story all the time when you know that they could just read your history. Um, but I guess my history is so long <laughs> that, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things that you just kind of have to deal with every time you see a new doctor. But there are some things 
um, when it comes to them like prescribing medications and things like that. Um, because then they find out that I'm on all this other medication <laughs> and then they'll realize, oh yeah, I gotta find a different, you know, something that won't react to these medications. Um, so I still have a, just a regular medical oncologist that I see every so often. Um, but I think since I was recently discharged from my transplant oncologist, that those appointments will probably go away. Um, I do have to see or keep up with a cardiologist um, just because, you know, the treatments are hard on your heart, especially being a young patient, um, since there's so much time for any, um, like, radiation scarring, like, that could become worse over time. So I have to continue to follow up with a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, um, and a dermatologist since my skin GVHD was so bad. Yeah, they, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, when I was getting diagnosed at first, you know, I kind of thought that it was just gonna be, you know, just chemo and that was it. But then there's, you know, chemo affects your entire body. So you have to continuously make sure that the rest of your body is still able to handle the treatment. Um, so there's just a lot of monitoring every part of you. Um, so I remember like even things I didn't know that they did, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I didn't know that you could get like a CT scan of your brain. <laughs> And I just saw it like on my schedule and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, it was just a lot of, a lot of different tests and things like that too. And even post-treatment, like tr just trying to rehab from cancer. Like I didn't even know that was a thing, like being in cancer rehabilitation. Like I had to do a lot of physical therapy, like I had to, one of my medications was giving me really bad hand tremors. So I had to do like a lot of hand exercises and basically relearn how to write. Um, I like even simple things that people take for granted, like being able to sit up and like sit up from a sitting position, stand up from a sitting position. Um, like I had to practice that so many times because I was just, like falling over. <laughs> um, it's like a lot of recovery. And, you know, even today, like I still, I, st I still can't be as active as I used to, you know, um, I like, before I started treatment, I ran a half marathon. And I don't even think I could walk a mile now. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just, a lot of recuperation just from treatment too. So since um, that last scan for remission, they've just been monitoring blood work. And if anything was, you know, uh, was wrong with my blood work, then they would move to the scan. So luckily it's been um, good. <laughs> so how do you feel? I'm almost done, gonna be. Was it discharged? Discharged. Today. Feels exciting. Very happy for you. Why? Because you don't have to come to Denver anymore. And it means you're done. Some people think, I guess outsiders mostly, people who haven't had cancer will say that once you're in remission, you know, you're all good. Um, but that's really not how survivorship is. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. A lot of, not only did I have to do a lot of physical therapy, but I had to do a lot of mental therapy, you know, talking to my therapist all the time um, and just working on my mental health was very important. Um, so there's, 
it it starts to it does become cancer does become intertwined with a lot of ex- aspects in your life if not all of them um and just because you're in remission um doesn't mean that you don't have to stop thinking about it you just don't think about it as much <laughs> um but there are still like triggers and obstacles that you come across um, post-cancer that will remind you that that was something that you went through and that you have to do things a little differently now maybe because of what you've been through. Um, There are things that I think about now whenever, you know, I'm doing something. Like I know that if I'm traveling, like I can't, be on my feet too long so sometimes I'll have to get a wheelchair at the airport you know there's just there's different things that you just have to adjust to but the important thing is that you're still here (laughs) you're still alive you're still doing it so um I guess it's just you know cancer just likes to remind you to appreciate life a little bit more (laughs) Um, So I did see a reproductive specialist before my first ever chemotherapy session, Um, but it wasn't stressed to me the importance of doing any kind of egg freezing or something like that because I had a blood cancer and a lot of patients are able to do, you know, the first round of treatment and move on with their lives and conceive, have children. Um, So that that was the kind of mindset that they led me to believe. Um, And so with the timing of everything, there just wasn't enough time to think about doing egg freezing. Um, And, you know, I was young at the time. So I was just like, yeah, I'm young, I'll bounce back, like, it'll happen. Um, But then, of course, like, my, my treatment did not go as planned. (laughs) So unfortunately, I didn't have that to fall back on. So that was another thing that I was very direct about when I first met my husband. Um, I was very clear that, you know, like, not only do I have cancer, but there's probably a good chance that I won't be able to have children either. Um, So, you know, he was very receptive to that. His family has a lot of adopted children in their family, too. So he was like, you know, I know all about adoption and, you know, I'll be on board just as long as you're healthy. Um, So... Um, We did meet with another reproductive specialist after um, I was in remission and after all that. And we did testing to see if I could conceive. And um, that was when I was told that I'm already in menopause, which is probably why I was sweating so much at night. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but um, so there was an option to do like an egg donor and have a surrogate and all that stuff. But um, we just didn't really feel comfortable going that route. So our plan is to adopt, um, but that's, there's still a lot of research that we're doing um, and a lot of saving up that we're doing because um, not being able to conceive your own child is very expensive. (laughs) Um, So that's, that's, our eventual goal is to adopt a child. Um, Well, a lot of people ask me why I like to share my story so much (laughs) and why I'm so open about um, what I've been through, what I'm going through. Um, And I just, when I was getting diagnosed, there was really nothing that gave me that personable experience of what it's really like to go through. And that's why I like to share my story because, you know, I was trying to find people's stories online and stuff like that, just to see what it was like. And I could not find anything. So 
I think it's really important to share your story, what you're going through. And it just really helps people not feel so alone. Um, and <laughs> that's why I like to share my story because I mean, I, I can't name a lot of young adult Asian patients. Um, and so I really like to advocate for um, people who have the same background as me because it was a very grueling process. And I feel like a lot of, you know, research needs to be done on different kinds of cancer care, depending on your genetics. And so I just, I want people to be able to find my stories and what um, I have to say, just because it's, it's just so much more comforting um, hearing it from cancer patients themselves.